we welcome you to the Monday service in Holy Week at Atherton Uniting Church. Just a reminder, if you need any assistance, please contact our Minister, Reverend Johnson McCotty. A word of encouragement to you all, for Christ is still here with us and will still be with us until the end of time. Take heed that Christ has already won the battle for us. The glad hosannas are no longer heard. The shouting is over. The palms are gathered. The shadows lengthen. The plotting begins in earnest. Knowing the outcome, we come with heavy hearts. And what do we hear? An unchanged and unchanging message of love. God's love. A poet's love. A woman's love. God's love, foretold by Isaiah, in the shape of a servant. Let us pray. Six days before his death, your son sat with Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead, and ate dinner with his friends. Once again, your gospel tells us Martha served, and Mary knelt at Jesus' feet to anoint them with costly perfume. The disciple who was about to betray him said, that it was a waste. He didn't care about the poor. Really, he just wanted to feel his own pockets and make Mary feel ashamed. Lord God, often we cannot discern what is best when to pour out costly perfume for your sake, even if the world thinks it is a waste. When to be busy serving or when to rest at your son's feet and learn, give us ears to hear you and eyes to see. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like to introduce Reverend Russell Clark to do the rest of the service for Monday Holy Week. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Sorry. I'd like to share with you from Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 15 to 18. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, it is written, my house will call a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it into a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. Then evening came, and they went out into the city. There was once a town by a lake, and the people who lived in the town enjoyed going out and fishing in that lake. And they loved coming home with their fish, and often they would sit on the corner of the street corners and talk about the fish they'd caught, about what fish were in season, about what fish were running and what were biting. And they got very enthused about, what they, about their occupation. And so they decided that what they would do is to form a little fishing club where they could meet and talk. And the first night they had the club, they found that there were too many people for the house where they met. So they thought, well, the best thing we can do is to build a hall. Why don't we call it a hall, call it the Fisherman's Club? And so they built this massive hall, but they didn't have any money. So they started doing uh, chook raffles and, uh, and doing little things to raise money. And they got busy raising money for that. And then they thought if they wanted to build a hall, why not have a little area where you could make sinkers and, and hooks and things like that to save them buying. So they, they started making sinkers and hooks. And then they started showing people what's the best way to tie a, a hook onto a line. What's the best season to go out fishing? And they got so preoccupied with what they were doing, they forgot to fish. And one day, a young boy went out and caught a couple of fish, and he came back, and he was really excited. So they sent him round the countryside to run seminars on how you should catch fish. They were so embroiled in what they were doing, they forgot what their purpose was. And it's so easy, I think, to forget our purpose. The Old Testament has a history of forgetfulness where people went into the promised land and said they would worship the Lord their God and they forgot. Where people started to become more obsessed about their own privileges 
than they did about serving their God. And the Old Testament is littered with people who had good intentions, but somehow they got taken off track. And finally we find in the times of the prophets that there was a religious shop front, but behind the scenes people were doing things that were certainly not followers of, of Yahweh. And so God sends this message, this rescue mission. We have a rescue package in the, in the form of Jesus who comes to get people back on track. Not only to get people back on track, but to save them. And when he sees what's happening in the temple and how much people have got off track, he is deeply angry. Angry at people who should have known better. Angry at people who were supposed to be leading the Jewish people, but who had turned away. It's a sad thing to come face to face with an angry Jesus. We don't think of Jesus as an angry person. We like to call him something like gentle Jesus, meek and mild. We like a tame Jesus. We like a domesticated Jesus. We like a compassionate Jesus. We might even dare to call him courageous. We might dare to call him authoritative. But an angry Jesus? I think we'd prefer to have a Jesus as someone that we can control or subdue. But in this passage, we find a highly emotional Jesus. And in the last weeks of Jesus' life, we find there are times when he is highly emotional and deeply moved. A couple of weeks ago, I, I preached on Lazarus. And it says there that Jesus was deeply moved. On Wednesday, I'll be talking about Judas. And Jesus, again, it says, was deeply moved at the time of the Passover. Why is deep, Jesus deeply moved? With regards to Lazarus, I remember saying that he was angry at what Satan had done to humanity. When he turns up the tables, it seems he is angry at what we have done to each other in the name of religion. And with regards to Judas, I feel he is disturbed because what Jesus offers is so often refused by so many people. My house will be a house of prayer, but you've made it into a den of robbers. <coughs> how, how did they make it into a den of robbers? It's interesting, if I duck back to Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, it says, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you say, how are we robbing you? In the tithes and offerings that you're not bringing. But here it goes beyond just monetary things. It goes to exploiting people, not just financially, but emotionally and spiritually. And I think Jesus offers us a warning. We, we dare not come under an angry Jesus who says, is this a house of prayer or is it a den of robbers? You know, it's so easy for us to slip into a den of being a den of robbers. What can change as circumstances change? Maybe we've been hurt sometime and we, we give up on the church. Maybe there is something that we find is a little bit morally different and we don't do it. Or we're led into doing it. A little while ago in another church, our church computer broke down. And we had a meeting and we said, well, we're entitled to get a new computer under our insurance. And one old gentleman in that group said, hang on a minute, that computer was donated to us. We didn't pay a penny for it. We should not be claiming on insurance something that we never bought. And I was so glad he brought us back from that point of sometimes skipping corners so circumstances can change us. People can influence us. Sometimes we look at other people that are Christians and we say, and, and we are influenced by them in the wrong way. Sometimes as Christians, we influence people in the wrong way. I have a friend who is a strong Christian, but she tells me that, you know, if she wasn't a Christian, there would be some Christians who would turn her off the faith. And the third thing I think that can make us slip away is our own attitude. Our attitude of sometimes cutting corners, sometimes forgetting what our calling is. 
It's interesting that the third commandment says, do not take the Lord's name in vain. And sometimes we think that's saying, oh, that's saying Jesus when we hit our, th our thumb with a hammer. But it's more than that. Jesus' name is his character. And every time we do something that robs Jesus of his dignity or his name or his character, we are breaking that third commandment. And when we slip away from having a house of prayer, we find ourselves doing shadow ministry. We are busy, we are working, we are doing all these things, but we're not doing what God wants. We're not doing what God, what, what God wants. It's interesting, Eugene Peterson, in his book, uh, Working the Angles, says this about American pastors. And it doesn't just apply to pastors, it applies to us all. He says, American pastors are abandoning their posts left and right at an alarming rate. They're not leaving their churches and getting other jobs. Congregations still pay their salaries, their names remain on the church stationery, and they continue to appear in pulpits on Sundays. But they are abandoning their post, their calling. They've gone whoring after other gods. The pastors of America have metamorphosed into a company of shopkeepers and the shops they sell are churches. They keep our churches. They are preoccupied with shopkeepers' concerns. How to keep the customers happy. How to lure customers away from the competitors down the road. How to package the goods so the customers will lay out more money. Some of them are very good shopkeepers. They attract a lot of customers. They pull in great sums of money, develop splendid reputations. Yet it is still shopkeeping. Religious shopkeeping to be sure, but shopkeeping all the same. Sometimes we need to come face to face with a determined emotional Jesus and ask, Jesus, in what way have I robbed you? In what way have I change my heart so that it is not a house of prayer anymore. We need to be challenged that we become a house of prayer and not a den of robbers. Let's pray. Loving God, you know our hearts, you know our thoughts. You know that sometimes we go through the process of being religious but it doesn't touch the heart. And so, Lord, we ask that you would challenge us this Easter to come and bring to us the realities of our calling. Each of us have been called by you. Lord, make us true to that call and keep us on track. Turn over the tables in our hearts of anything that you feel needs to go so that as the birds go out the window, so too, the things that we do that disappoint you will flee. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.